Hey everyone, I'm back. Sorry about the lack of videos in February. After doing three in January and having real life's responsibilities be a time vampire, I kinda just missed February entirely. But don't worry, I'm here now, and I'm here to tell you to play a real Shin Megami Tensei game. Play a Real SMT Game is a series of reviews I've started to help encourage myself to dive more into the SMT franchise as a whole. My general rule of thumb being as long as it has Aggie, Zeo, Bufu style skills in it, we can consider it an SMT game. Basically, as long as I can Megadolion a bitch, I'm happy. Since it's the newest game that's come out by Atlas, we'll be looking at Persona 5 Strikers as I was planning on playing it anyway. Strikers is kind of an interesting one, as when it was first announced, I was one of the leading generals in the anti-Persona 5 militia, and it was my personal mission to tell everyone that it sucked. In reality, I actually thought that P5 was a big step up in a number of ways for the series, with how it presented dungeons and how social links fed into the RPG system more, but I also felt the game had a fair few problems as well, such as how the early party members feel a bit too similar to previous games and how overall the story writing was a bit of a step back in my opinion, especially as the game went on. However, the thing that caused me to be really salty about it was that when I took a break from the game to concentrate on college for a bit, the internet decided to spoil just about every single plot point for me, which completely killed my desire to continue. So from here, let's fast forward to the announcements of Persona 5 Royal and the then titled Persona 5 Scramble. With these two announcements, my interest in the series shifted from a minus two to about a one. Royal was what I thought it would be, and the hope was it could fix my gripes with the original game, but I also wasn't expecting too much. Luckily, it did fix or at least remedy a lot of my gripes, and while fixing my problems with the game's writing was unlikely, it did at the very least provide the third semester, which went above and beyond my expectations. And on the other hand, we had the trailer for Scramble, and my initial impression was an eye roll and a sigh. See, I do actually like Musou games quite a bit, but I only really have enough desire to play one every five, six, maybe seven years. And over that period, every few months I'll come back to it, just to grind out materials to upgrade my characters. And since I've already got Fire Emblem Warriors to do that, I just kind of assumed Scramble would be another one I'd just ignore. But with each trailer that we saw afterwards, that opinion started to change. The more we saw, it became clear that the game still retained the social sim elements to some extent. And you could see that combat took place in what seemed like dungeons instead of the typical battlefields that you'd find in games like Dynasty and Hyrule Warriors. It started to become more and more apparent that what we were looking at wasn't your typical Musou game, and in fact, I'd argue it isn't really one at all, but instead is actually an action RPG that was built upon the skeleton of Omega Force's previous works. And it's the reason why I got excited for Persona 5 again, and why I gave it another chance of Royal, which I'm very glad that I did. The Warriors series has always followed a pretty rigid formula, and despite what Koei Tecmo would like you to believe, they're not actually action games. The best way I'd describe Musou games is by saying that they're actually battlefield management simulators that pretend to be action games to drive up sales. What Musou is to Devil May Cry or Ninja Gaiden is what Football Manager 20XX is to FIFA. And the games are really only designed to be stress relief to the many overworked businessmen and women of Japan as they are able to leave the hellish, hectic reality of the workplace where they have no control over the nightmare that's going on, and can instead enjoy the blissful fantasy of being able to single-handedly save every single NPC, captain or fort that's in trouble in the blink of an eye. And on top of all of that, there's easily a year's supply of dopamine locked away in all the different ways that you can upgrade your characters. As the game's main story mode is effectively just a taste test of everybody you can play as, and a sort of tutorial for it all. And then the real Musou experience begins at the 100 hour post game that just feels like endless grinding, because that's all it's really meant to be. Persona 5 Strikers on the other hand doesn't really have any of that, and instead of the endless cycle of 10 to 20 minute levels in which you're plonked onto a battlefield and are told to capture all the forts, you instead progress through actual structured levels with very light puzzle and platforming elements as well as various individual encounters and mini-bosses scattered throughout. 
Its structure is much closer to something like Kingdom Hearts or Tokyo Xanadu than a typical Musou game. Granted, the combat itself does use Omega Force's standard layout of having a simple string of light attacks and various strong attack combo enders that have different utilities. What Strikers does though is implement features from the Persona games like having a huge emphasis on exploiting enemy weaknesses, which can be done by using SP to cast skills from a menu. Or, if you wish to conserve SP, there are a number of options for every character to cast a weaker but free version of some of their skills as a combo ender. Like the other modern Persona games, exploiting enemy weaknesses is insanely beneficial, as you'll whittle down a stun meter that once it's fully drained you are able to deal a big amount of damage by doing an all-out attack, and this is your main way of dealing with large groups of enemies or doing a huge amount of damage to bosses' health bars. It's a very fun, albeit slightly repetitive gameplay loop. However, it does mean that the game rewards picking a perfect team setup for each boss and just spamming whatever they're weak to, so then you keep them in a permanent stagger state. A little bit too much for my liking. The bosses themselves are actually fairly well designed, with various interactable objects in each arena that you'll see throughout the levels as well, and if utilised correctly, will be a huge boon to you. Something that I think also helps the game out a lot is that due to having a relatively smaller cast compared to its contemporaries, means that the Phantom Thieves all have various gimmicks that help each other stand out amongst themselves, and all have an individual game plan that you can strive towards. Arn, for example, is able to buff her whip with fire, allowing her to inflict fire damage on all of her attacks and not just her combo finishes. This gives her more chances of inflicting the burn status, which can then feed into a passive skill that she learns called Soul Thief, which restores some of her SP every time she inflicts an ailment, resulting in her in having a somewhat renewable source of magic. Alternatively, we have more technically proficient characters, like Yusuke, who, with the right timing, can counter any attack in the game. On top of this, his counter does a ton of critical and therefore stun damage, and also increases how long he can keep his next combo finisher going. Or there's the new character, Sophia, who fights with two yo-yos and bless magic, whose attacks will get stronger when each attack is timed correctly. So if you just continue well, to I'll mash the XXX, 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 XXX and the YYY and the XXX and the YYY, again, you'll be sucked. These niches of each character are then further expanded upon as they learn their different master arts, which are four upgrades to each character's moveset which are awarded to the player when using them. Stuff like Ryuji's charge attacks not taking as long to get to full strength, or not consuming ammo when you use the auto-aim on Joker's gun, but gaining a powerful charge shot instead when you do use the lock-on. On top of the game's combat, P5 Strikers doesn't really follow the typical 10-ish hour story mode followed by an extremely long post-game that the Musou series normally sticks to. Instead, the ratios are kind of switched the other way around, with the base game clocking in at around about 50 to 60 hours, and there really only being a very little bit of post-game content if you've managed to keep up with the side quests as you've gone on. There is a new game plus with some extra stuff, such as exclusive side quests that give you stronger armour and upgraded weapons, as well as a tough as nails merciless mode that seems brutal even at max stats, but it doesn't seem like an endless pool of content like the other Musou games. A typical story for a Musou game is usually a bunch of contrived reasons to get the main characters to all fight each other, but in P5S it's really not like that at all. The game is a genuine sequel to the original, and it does an excellent job of showing that. The story takes place over summer during the gang's break from school and college, and despite them doing one last job about four different times at the end of the first game, they've once again been dragged into the metaverse with new palace-like locations appearing called Jails, which give individuals with distorted desires the ability to change hearts and because of so many cases occurring all over the country, the police have concluded that it's the work of the Phantom Thieves, so Joker and his pals have to take up their mantles once again to clear their names. Overall, I like the game's story quite a bit, as there's a lot of things that I think it does right. For starters, the first few dungeons give characters like Haru and Yusuke some more time to shine in the spotlight, which was really refreshing to see, as it gave them a bit more personal stake in the story outside of their introductory dungeons. It also means that Haru finally got some of that sweet screen time that she deserves, since Royal gave her like two new scenes in the main game, and one of them was her helping Trash pick up Trash. The two new characters, Sophia and Zenkichi Hasegawa, are also two incredibly wonderful additions to the cast, and they both bring their own compelling story arcs to the table. 
Atlas realised when making Scramble that P5 didn't have a cute robot girl in it yet, and so that's how we got Sophia, an artificial intelligence that can take physical form within the metaverse. Wanting to follow her prime directive of becoming humanity's companion, she joins the Phantom Thieves and installs herself into Joker's phone in the real world so she is able to learn more about the human heart. And honestly, she's just the cutest thing ever. Zenkichi, on the other hand, is a member of PubSec, who is very much aware that the Phantom Thieves are not to blame for the incidents, so instead decides to cut them a deal to work together so they can catch the real culprit. It's honestly really cool seeing an adult join the main cast in a modern Persona game, and it's really fun just seeing all the younger generation constantly take jabs at him. His story explores his relationship between him and his daughter, and it's a very similar situation to Sojiro and Futaba, as well as Dojima and Nanako, however it is handled a little bit differently, I feel. Are there any other Father figures. I should know about? Meow. I'm out of here. On top of that, we get to see how he as an inspector tries to deal with corruption within police, which gives us a different perspective on Persona 5's themes of rebellion. What really surprised me about Stryker's story though is that while it's certainly not as ambitious as Persona 5's plot, it's also not trying to be. And as a result of that, it feels like the writing is significantly better because of it. The original Persona 5 started off really strong, but as it went on, it slowly started to fall apart, with some really contrived stuff like Ryuji and Morgana's lover spat. I also got the impression that the writers felt a little bit too proud of themselves when writing the script, as the message of choosing your own path is stated and then after that is never really elaborated on and just left as it is. These things are kind of expanded upon in Royal via the third semester by seeing the argument from a different angle, but the base game story is left mostly unchanged. Strikers, on the other hand, handles things a little differently. Due to the party already undergoing their character growth in the previous game, the message of Persona 5 Strikers is instead held on the shoulders of the monarchs of the game's jails. The villains of P5, barring a few exceptions, were all deplorable pieces of shit, whilst in Strikers the villains all have something in common, being that they're all well-meaning individuals who have strayed from their path for one reason or another, resulting in this overall theme of how the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And while I feel like the original game's villains worked for what they were trying to do, it is nice in Strikers having villains who are actual characters and not just evil moustache twirling people. This is not to say that the game's writing is perfect though. Due to wanting to introduce the characters the newcomers, there's a lot of jokes or character moments that are repeated to establish quirks. And while I do feel like the game does stick its landing for the most part, there is unfortunately a lot of rehashed ideas from the first game, especially towards the end. It's not a major problem, but I do really wish that they'd done something a little bit more interesting. And something that's more of a nitpick, as it doesn't really detriment the game, is that I do wish that Strikers had more nods to Royal. As Strikers does work as a sequel to both Vanilla P5 and its enhanced version, but unfortunately all we get is one mention of Yoshizawa, and that's hidden somewhere when some optional conversation. But again, it's really not that important. Speaking of being a sequel, one thing that P5S has on lockdown is the style, aesthetic and presentation of Persona 5. While I think that too many people overlook the Persona 4 arena games and dancing all night, disregarding them as spin-offs when they're legitimate sequels, I do understand why the switch to a sort of pseudo-visual novel style can make people shy away a bit. By the way, if you're interested, I do recommend the P4 manga followed up by doing the P3 route of Ultimax, as it gives Labrus a nice complete and concise arc. Luckily for the people who couldn't find the motivation to play the P4 follow-ups, you don't have to worry, because Strikers is very good at walking and talking just like a Persona game, albeit not perfectly. When you're not hacking and slashing your way through the metaverse, you're able to roam around the real world just like you do in the base game. The difference here, however, is that a lot of it has either been reduced in scale or replaced with some form of alternative. For starters, social links are gone. In fact, every single one of your confidants around the city have some reason or another to not be around, the only exceptions being Sojuro at the beginning of the game, and Sai doing a few things behind the scenes. The social link system has instead been replaced with bond skills. As you fight and do various side activities around the cities, you'll gain experience which will grant you bond points, which can be then spent on various upgrades for the entire party, ranging from simple things such as stat boosters or increasing the money you get from each battle, to things like increasing the amount of ammo you bring to each fight, and even an auto-counter when dodging an attack at the last second. 
The game does kind of trick you at the beginning into thinking that there'll be a replacement to social link events to raise your bond level. There's this optional scene at the beginning where Ahn, Yu, and Ryuji go to a ramen shop and show Sophia around. It gives you bond experience and there's a little tutorial screen for it, implying that there'll be more, but this is, as far as I could tell, the only example of something like this. As from my experience, the only other examples of something kind of like this is drawing a lucky fortune and finding a four-leaf clover for Sophia, both of which were about four lines of text and nothing else, with the rest of my bonding points either coming from battles or mandatory story events. Something that's kind of been cut back in scale but also expanded upon in other ways is the actual cities themselves. Notice I said cities and not just Tokyo. See, in Strikers, every dungeon takes the Phantom Thieves to a new location as you explore various places all over Japan. This however does come at the cost of every location only being around about two or three areas big. For example, the only places you can go to in Tokyo is Shibuya and the area around LeBlanc. I never felt like it was too restricted though, since you never stick in one place for too long and the scenery does change at a decent rate. And as a weeb, it's also really nice to see a bunch of real life locations in Japan and be able to recognise them. I've never visited the country myself before, but I do get a kick out of going, oh my god, we're in Dantabori, it's just like Yakuza 2. Look, there's the bridge the Kiryu threw a guy off of. And oh my god, we're in Okinawa, it's just like Yakuza 3. There's a Shisa statue just like that one sub story. And, look, it's the metaverse, it's just like Yakuza- I think you get the picture. Something that also comes back that I'm very surprised made a return was the Persona Fusion mechanic. The Velvet Room showing up was a given, but actually using it was another matter, as I thought that Joker would just use Arsene. But needless to say, Joker still has his wildcard abilities and Fusion does return. It does work a little bit differently, and the overall number of Personas has dropped from about 190 to just over 75, but the majority of the favourites are still there. But there are a few that I miss, like Rangda and Barong. At least I've still got my waifu Mothman. And I'm not entirely sure how it works in Strikers, but there's only a few set recipes for every fusion, opposed to how the other games calculate what you're going to get but it's fairly unnoticeable when playing normally. It's only when you're in the late game and you go back and get a low level persona from an earlier dungeon that you realise that you can't actually fuse it into anything. There are, however, a few really cool quality of life features in Strikers that I hope the other SMTs going forward will pick up on. For starters, whenever you fuse personas together, if any of them are stronger than what's currently in the register, the vendor will ask you if you'd like to register them just before fusing. This means that the chances of you fusing away something good and losing it because you forgot to register it is incredibly low. There's also a new mechanic known as Persona Points, which are gained whenever you delete, fuse, or gain a Persona that you can't hold. Persona Points can either be converted into experience to give to your Personas, or later on you're able to buy stat boosts with them, and this is the makeup for the lack of arcane boosts from social links. The last thing I want to mention about the game's general presentation is how Strikers really captures the original style so well. It's been very faithfully recreated while still doing some new stuff as well. There's a whole new set of different menus that flip, spin, and fold in on themselves, and they're just as stylish as before. In fact, they arguably took it a little bit too far, as by the end of the game, I was a little bit tired of watching Futaba's Necronomicon do a little spin for a second every time I wanted to open the config menu, but really, it's not that much. How they also nail the aesthetic of the original is through the game's music, which goes above and beyond what it needed to. The game has this excellent balance of old, remixed, and brand new tracks all within it. Starting the game off, you'll have a bunch of tracks that you know really well, spending time in LeBlanc and walking around Shibuya, giving you this feeling that you're coming home after being away for a long time, which is just like how it is for Joker. But it isn't that long at all until you enter the first dungeon and you're greeted with the game's first remix, and it's incredible how even after being burnt out from all the memes, Strikers somehow managed to get me excited to hear Last Surprise again. And all of the new songs are just as good as you'd find in Persona 5 and Royal as well. There are a few tracks, like the various city themes, that are nothing particularly special, but they're decent enough just for chopping in each area. But songs like Daredevil, Axe to Grind, and What You Wish For have all been happily sitting in my music rotation since the demo came out in Japan early last year. Also, you know a game is confident in its own soundtrack, when at one point it uses Rivers in the Desert as a warm-up track to get you ready for what's to come. And while I'm on the subject of music, I think I should also mention that one of my favourite features in the game comes in the form of the DLC music. 
Unlike Royal, where the battle theme was tied to what costume you were wearing, in Strikers you can select whatever you want from the tracks available. But what you can also do is have it randomly pick from a selection and toggle which ones you want on and off from that. It's very akin to how The World Ends With You handles it, giving you a collection of certified bangers that are randomly played for each random battle, meaning that no song gets too repetitive. Even if you don't purchase the music DLC itself, you can unlock the OG version of Last Surprise and Takeover that can be added to the list once beating the game. And if you've got it on PS4 or Switch, you can get those early if you have a P5 Royal save or Joker in Smash. Wrapping things up, I just want to quickly talk about the different ports of the game as well as my closing thoughts. I played the game on PC, but I've also played the demo on PS4 Pro and Switch when it came out in Japan last year, so I have a good overview of each platform. I'll start with the PS4 port because it's probably the version that most people will play. The vanilla PS4 is very clearly the benchmark platform when they made Strikers. If you pick the resolution mode, you'll be able to enjoy the game at 1080p, 60 frames per second, it's really that simple. Unfortunately, if you play it on PS4 Pro or PS5, what you'll get is actually worse looking, as backwards as that sounds. The game runs at a dynamic 4K in resolution mode, but the cell shading is not at res 2, which means that you get these really crisp 1080p black outlines on every character that look really jaggy. This wouldn't actually be a problem, but unfortunately the Pro version also removes any anti-aliasing from both modes as well, meaning that these jaggies and the shimmer that accompanies them are even more pronounced. There's probably a good chance that to you this is a very minor thing and it's not going to bother you, but I do feel like I should mention it, as I think it's a problem with the actual Musou engine itself, and it's probably the one thing that I think stops it looking like the original. As for the Switch version, it's fine. It's only 30 FPS, it's a little bit blurry and soft looking, and it has no anti-aliasing either, but luckily the lower resolution kind of smears those jaggies out a bit. It's not necessarily the way I'd want to play it, but it's certainly no means a bad port, especially compared to some of the things Switch owners have to put up with. For the PC players, if you've played a PC port published by Sega in the last few years, you probably know what to expect. In terms of tweakable options, you've got about the same sort of stuff you'd find in Persona 4 Golden and Valkyria Chronicles 4. Not exactly the most exciting ports with new features, but it's very competent. What is nice is the cell shading does scale with display resolution properly, so if you want a version of the game running at 4K, this is the version to go for, not the PS4 Pro version. Unfortunately, the port itself is a little bit iffy in a few places though. I had a number of crashes throughout my time with the game, one that kept happening after the boss of the Kyoto dungeon, and wouldn't stop doing so until I left the dungeon and then re-entered via a checkpoint instead. I'm not sure why this stopped the game from crashing in the loading screen after the boss, but for some reason it did. The game also seems to have the same problems P4G has on PC, where the anime and pre-rendered cutscenes would jitter a little bit, which is odd because I thought they'd fix that in P4G already, but I'm not sure. Finally, while I never had a problem with it, there is apparently a bug that prevents people from playing the game in full screen. Hopefully all of this will be patched and fixed in the near future though. To finally start wrapping things up though, I just want to say that I'm really glad that Strikers ended up turning out the way it did. If those trailers had just shown a typical Musou game, this series of reviews would probably not exist since playing Royal reminded me that SMT combat is really damn fun. Also, playing an action SMT game really makes me excited for what Atlas would do if they made another spin-off like Raido Kuzanoa or something else entirely. Although, now that they're doing quite well for themselves, I would like them to speed up general game development a bit. Like how the PS2 had like, what, eight Shin Megami Tensei games? And for all of those games, they reused the same models for the demons, so it'd be really cool if they made some cheaper spin-offs but used those Persona 5 models for the demons that they've already got made. That's what they've done here for Strikers, and based off what we've seen for Shin Megami Tensei 5, that's what they're doing for that game as well. For my final thoughts, I just want to say that my favourite part of Persona 5 Strikers, ironically enough, was the character writing, which is really surprising for a Musou game. I couldn't really work out where I wanted to put this while talking about the story, but I did just want to say that I especially like the arc where Yusuke takes centre stage. It has a much more personal message about art and being creative, and it's a hell of a lot more relatable than a multi-billion art thievery story that the original had. And I hope that all of you either enjoy it or enjoyed it just as much as I did. Hey there! I hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to watch the first video in this series, then I have a review of Soul Hackers that should be on screen right now. 
It's the first video in this Play a Real Shin Megami Tensei series that I'm doing, and I explain in a bit more detail as to why I started it. Alternatively, if you've already watched that, then maybe give my video on various Ichio games a look. It's had barely any views, and it's a shame because I think there's some really cool games in there, especially the two RPG Maker games by Temi. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching, and like and subscribe if you want to see some more.